Good evening. It is uh, great to be in Arkansas. It is great to be at the Clinton School. What, what an honor. Let me start by thanking Elaine for that uh, very kind introduction um, and to Chip for the invitation to be with you this evening. Um, it, it is truly an honor to be here. Let me um, start by making one thing clear. Um, there's a big difference between the CIA of the movies and the real CIA. <laughs> First, the fiction. In the movies, senior CIA officials are played by dashing men like Harrison Ford, James Earl Jones, and Alec Baldwin. Now the reality. About two years ago, I got a rather short haircut and walked through my front door and my teenage daughter took one look at me and said, Dad, you look like Forrest Gump. <laughs> so tonight, no Harrison Ford. And if that's not enough to convince you that I don't get a lot of respect at home, let me tell you about another movie story. Um, this is the time that after the Bin Laden raid, um, when Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bowl came to the agency just a week after the raid and said that they wanted to make Zero Dark Thirty and they wanted our help. And I spent 30, 45 minutes with them chatting that day. And I went home that night and I told my wife, Mary Beth, all about my conversation with this Oscar-winning producer and Oscar-winning uh, screenwriter. And I told her that in the movie Zero Dark Thirty that I wanted Matt Damon to play me. <laughs> well, Mary Beth, as only a wife can do, smiled slightly and said, Honey, I love you very much, but Matt Damon is going to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> OK, let me. Um, let me really begin by saying that what I want to do in the next 30 to 40 minutes or so is say a few words about the business of intelligence. I'd also like to talk about the role of CIA. And in doing so, I'll talk about some of my own experiences. And I want to talk about CIA officers and their deep dedication and deep commitment to confronting our nation's most critical national security challenges. And then I'll answer any questions as, uh, as Skip will let me answer. Um, I'll start by making two points that I think are really quite powerful. The first is that the number of significant national security issues facing our country has never been greater than it is today. Just think about what the president and his national security team face every day. International terrorism, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, cyber espionage and warfare, the wind down of the war in Afghanistan, countries like Iran and North Korea where the regimes are adversaries of the United States critically important countries like Mexico and Pakistan who face long-term security challenges that quite frankly are very dangerous to the United States. Enduring challenges like Russia and China, one of which is playing out as we speak. And profound change in what I consider to be still the most important place on the planet, the Middle East. I could go on but I think the point is clear, the sheer number of critically important issues is staggering. The Cold War has been replaced by the blizzard wars, I'd like to say. Second, nearly all of the issues that I've just listed are first and foremost intelligence issues. That's not an overstatement. Intelligence is at the heart of nearly every national security challenge we face as a nation. Whether you're talking about terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, drug trafficking, cyber, whatever, 
Good intelligence is the foundation for our country's approach to those issues and to the world. Look at it this way. Nearly anyone who reads a newspaper can give you a view on the Eurozone crisis or even a view on Chinese politics. Certainly any expert can give you an insightful view on those issues. But not just anyone or any expert can give you a view on the status of the Iranian nuclear program or the status of the North Korean missile program or the current capabilities and intentions of Al Qaeda to attack the homeland. Doing those things requires intelligence. The bottom line is that our nation's leaders cannot understand these issues, cannot make policy on these issues, and in many cases cannot take action on those issues without first-rate intelligence. So you put those two points together, right? The sheer volume of national security issues and the fact that intelligence plays such an important role in addressing them leads to what I think is the critical point. Intelligence has never been more important than it is today. The intelligence communities and the CIA's business is booming more than any time during my 33-year career at the CIA and more than at any time that I'm aware of in the 67-year history of the agency. In short, it is a great time to be an intelligence officer. If CIA were a for-profit company, you would want to make a long-term investment in the agency. So what is CIA's role in this, in this intelligence story? What does the CIA actually do? CIA's job is to do three things. Steal secrets, make sense of those secrets for our nation's most senior decision makers, and conduct covert action to influence events abroad. Let me touch on each one of these briefly. The first thing CIA does is collect information that others deliberately try to conceal. There are many ways to collect secrets, satellites, intercepted communications, and the like. Sometimes the information our country needs can be obtained only through a well-placed agent. That means a spy. That's where CIA comes in. CIA pays people, its sources, its spies, to pass us information, documents, hard drives, thumb drives, whatever. CIA pays those sources to spy on their country, their fellow terrorists, their fellow drug traffickers, to gather secret information on those who want to kill Americans or undermine our national security. That's the fundamental business that we're in. And it is not easy. It is very hard. Such human sources can make the difference between success and failure. Let me give you an example. In 2002, a source inside of Al Qaeda provided CIA with information on the whereabouts of a guy named Abu Zubaydah, a senior Al Qaeda operative. That information led to Abu Zubaydah's capture. Information from Zubaydah helped lead to the capture of 9-11 mastermind colleague Sheikh Mohammed, the guy who put the whole operation together. And information from colleague Sheikh Mohammed helped disrupt a terrorist network in Southeast Asia that was planning on flying planes into, into uh, high-rise buildings on the west coast of the United States. So in short, there is no substitute for what we call in our business human, human intelligence, spies, human beings. CIA does this extremely well. Sometimes I'll see retired CIA officers on TV claiming that the agency's case officers spend all their time in first world capitals going to cocktail parties. Nonsense. Al Qaeda is not on the cocktail circuit. Neither is CIA. Since 9 11, CIA has been putting more case officers in some of the most lawless places on the planet. 
We are developing innovative ways to penetrate extremely difficult targets. The work is riskier than ever before. And while we work very hard to mitigate those risks, you cannot make them zero, cannot eliminate them. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit at the end. The second thing that the CIA does is all source analysis. It is what I grew up doing. Um, I often hear people describe the job with the metaphor, connect the dots. I've never really liked that image. Why? Because we all remember the connect the dots games we played as kids, right? The dots were right there in front of you. In fact, they were even numbered for you. They all go together one at a time. In fact, there weren't any spurious dots, right? They were all there to be used. It was easy. Intelligence problems, on the other hand, are not easy. They are hard. They are very hard. In fact, CIA does not do easy. It only does hard. A much better metaphor, a much better metaphor for me is that of a puzzle. Think about putting together a thousand piece puzzle and your job is to make a judgment about what's on the cover of the box which is missing. But this puzzle is a little bit different than any other puzzle you've been ever used, that you've ever been used to. Although it's a thousand piece puzzle, you have 5,000 pieces with which to work. And not all of the thousand relevant pieces are there. So you have to sort out which pieces belong to that puzzle, which pieces look like they belong, but really don't. And you have to make a judgment about what you were seeing with many of the relevant pieces missing. And you have to do this on a deadline because someone important is going to make a decision based on your judgment. That is what all source analysis feels like. The puzzle pieces are reports from CIA spies, intercepted messages, cables from our embassies and defense attaches, satellite photos, and more types of technical intelligence than I'm allowed to talk about. They also include open source information, foreign media, social media, and the like. That's what makes the analysis all source. The best example of all source analysis that I can give you is an analysis that never got done. It was the reason why the Central Intelligence Agency was created. I would love to take you to Hawaii to make real what I'm about to uh, say to you. If I did, I would take you to Pearl Harbor and I would ask you to face the water and I would tell you to look to your right and face the notch in the mountains that you would see if you turn to the right. And I would tell you that that is Koli Koli Pass, where on December 7th, 1941, Japanese zeros streamed through, passed in f right in front of where we would be standing, and attacked Ford Island, which would be to our left, where the Arizona Memorial now sits over its sunken namesake, which to this very day still gives up bits and pieces of the sailors and marines who are trapped inside. And I would tell you it, that is what happens to a nation that has all the pieces to the puzzle but does not have an all-source analytic capability to put those pieces together. Pearl Harbor is, is why the CIA was created. The last thing CIA does is covert action. People in the CIA don't normally give speeches. When they do, they usually talk about covert action, so I will be brief. <laughs> what is covert action? First, I'll give you the legal definition, and let me actually quote. An activity or activities of the United States government to influence political, economic, or military conditions abroad, where it is intended that the role of the United States government will not be apparent or acknowledged publicly, end quote. There's more to the statute than that, but those are the basics. So what does that mean in practice? Think of it this way. Covert action is the third choice between diplomacy 
and military action. It includes anything from covert influence to paramilitary operations. CIA is the only organization in the United States government authorized to conduct covert action. Every single president CIA has served has asked CIA to help implement foreign policy through covert action, every single one. You may probably know about the various examples from the Cold War, CIA's support to the Solidarity Movement in Poland, and CIA's support to the Afghan freedom fighters working to push the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan. How many people here have seen the movie Charlie Wilson's War? Well, Charlie Wilson's War, for the most part, is a true story. And the story describes classic covert action. And the kid in the movie who is this brilliant chess player, he is one of my best friends today. And my kids think I'm cool because I know him. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me add this about covert action. There are a lot of movies and books that focus on CIA rogue covert action. CIA operations that no one else in the government knows about and some that even CIA directors don't know about. That reality could not be further from the truth. All covert action is undertaken at the written direction of the President of the United States. It is approved by the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and many others. It is briefed to the intelligence committees in Congress who provide rigorous oversight for all covert action. It is vetted with lawyers at the Department of Justice. Sometimes these people forget about this later on. So clearly, so clearly, I'm sorry about the editorial comment. So, so clearly, our nation has a rigorous oversight regime for covert action. This is important because CIA is a secret intelligence organization operating in a democracy, and the American public needs to have confidence that the CIA is acting within the laws and the Constitution and in full accordance with the nation's values. Let me um, switch direction here a little bit and talk about CIA and terrorism, which to this day to this very day, remains the number one national security threat facing the United States. We are still at war with Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda still wants to kill Americans. Al Qaeda still wants to kill you and your families. And they are working very hard at it. So CIA case officers collect intelligence on terrorist groups and their activities. CIA analysts assess what that intelligence means from both a tactical and a strategic perspective. And CIA officers work to undermine and to degrade terrorist organizations. I want you to know that for CIA, the threat from terrorists is at the heart of what we do every day. It is CIA's top priority given to us by the President of the United States. CIA has a very strong sense of urgency about this mission. And that sense of urgency is captured in a sign as you enter the agency's counterterrorism center. The sign printed on a photograph of the collapsing World Trade Center towers simply reads, today is September 12, 2001. That is the perspective and that is the attitude that those officers bring to work every day. The fight against terrorism is a personal one for many CIA officers. And given the youth of the workforce at the agency, for many officers there, it, it has defined their entire career. For me personally, CIA's efforts in the global war against terrorism shaped the last 15 years of my career. And it did so in some very particular ways, um, which you heard Elaine describe, and which I want to talk about a little bit. So in 2001, I was serving as President Bush's intelligence briefer. 
every morning, actually in the middle of the night is more accurate, I would pull together all the intelligence materials from around the world to brief the president. I considered this among the best assignments a CIA analyst could possibly have, carrying the agency's best information and best analysis to a president and helping to shape his view of the world is a deep honor and even deeper responsibility. It was my job to decide both what to show the president um, and to decide how to brief it so that he would take away the key points and the context. On September 11th, I was with the president in Florida. As I waited to brief him in the hallway outside of his suite, United Airlines Flight 11 took off from Boston's Logan Airport. It was the first of the four hijacked planes that took to the air that day. From 8 o'clock till 8.30, I gave my briefing to the president, discussing the key national security issues of the day with him and with uh, his chief of staff, Andy Card. As the briefing finished, but unknown to us, of course, the transponder on Flight 11 stopped transmitting its identification friend and foe beacon. Along with others, I got into a van to follow the president to Booker T. Elementary School. During the 20-minute drive at just after 8.45 a.m., American Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Within minutes of the impact, cell phones all over the van were ringing. Ari Fleischer, the president's press secretary at the time, turned to me and asked, Michael, do you know anything about a plane hitting the World Trade Center? I said no, but I told him I would make some calls and try to find out. My assumption at that point, uh, one that the president later told reporters that he shared, was that the crash was an accident. You know, my vision, the vision in my mind was that a of, was of a small plane um, in bad weather uh, hitting the World Trade Center in an accident. This thought lasted only as long as it took me to contact the CIA Operations Center. The officer at the Ops Center with whom I spoke told me that the initial reports indicated that the plane was a large commercial jet. My mental image of what happened started to crumble. As I ended the call and walked into a classroom where the president's senior staff was waiting, United Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. It happened as all of us, and all of the senior White House staff and I were watching the television right in front of us. All of us in the room, of course, were stunned by what we saw. There was now no longer any question at all. This was a deliberate act of terrorism. I stayed with the president all day. Through the uncertainty as news stories of the tragedy became more and more grim, um, the rest of the day for me became a very strange mixture of the intensity of doing my job and the surreal. First, the doing my job part. Early on, a Palestinian terrorist group, the, Democrat, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, uh, took public responsibility for the attack. So the president asked me what I knew about this group. I told him that the group had a long history of terrorism against Israel, but that it did not have the capability to do what we had just seen play out. Sometime later, the group withdrew its claim. Um, on the flight from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, the president asked to see me alone. Only Andy Card joined us. The president said, Michael, who did this? I told him that I had not seen any intelligence that would speak to responsibility and that what I was going to say to him was my own personal view. He said he understood, but he said, get on with it. I said, Mr. President, there are 
two terrorist states with the capability to do this, Iran and Iraq, but that both had nothing to gain, nothing to gain, and everything to lose by doing this. Rather, I said the culprit was almost certainly a non-state actor, and adding that I had no doubt, no doubt that the trail would lead to the doorstep of bin Laden and al-Qaeda. I actually told him that I would bet my children's future on it, but I've never told my kids that. <laughs> the president then asked me, when will we know? When will we know? I said, Mr. President, I can't say for sure. And I went on to review for him how long it took us to have any certainty um, of responsibility for past attacks. So I talked about the Kobar Towers attack in Saudi Arabia, which took us almost a year to find out who was responsible. The near simultaneous bombings of our embassies in East Africa, which took just a couple days to find out who the perpetrators were. And the attack on the USS Cole um, in the harbor in um, Aden, Yemen, which took us a number of months to figure out who was responsible. So I told the president, Mr. President, we may know soon. And then again, it may take some time. When I was done, I was surprised I'd committed all of that history of the past attacks to memory. Then the surreal. Let me share the surreal with you. Not long after we took off from Sarasota, several of us were huddled in a senior staff compartment on Air Force One watching the news reports of the unfolding tragedy. It was there that we watched people jump to their deaths from the upper floors of the Twin Towers. And it was there that we watched the South Tower collapse and disappear into a plume of smoke and dust. And for several seconds, no one said anything. Then someone broke the silence by simply saying, my God. And then as we were on final approach to Andrews that evening, the president's military aide called me to one of the windows of Air Force One, and he pointed to an F-16 flying alongside. He said it was from the DC Air National Guard and that there was one on the other wing as well. As I looked at the pilot in the F-16, I could see his facial features, and I could see him looking at us. That's how close we were. And I could see the still burning Pentagon in the background. For the first time that day, tears came to my eyes. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, that sorrow turned to action for us. The immediate laser-like focus of our officers at all levels from the most senior to the most junior on driving our effort against those who had harmed us. That immediate turn from grief to action is something that defines us as an agency. Agility is one of the great strengths of the Central Intelligence Agency. Officers worked literally 24 hours a day, sometimes not leaving their offices for days at a time. People surged to the mission. Many volunteered without a second thought. The result was that CIA was at the tip of the spear in our nation's response to the attack. CIA officers were on the ground in Afghanistan working with the Northern Alliance against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda only two weeks after 9-11. That focus has never wavered in the year since. That focus led to the success of the bin Laden operation. Let me say a few words about that because it's one of the few public illustrations of a covert action that I can actually talk about and because it's fascinating. So how did we track down the world's most wanted man? Ever since 9-11, we had a systematic approach to trying to locate bin Laden. This involved several different approaches, different avenues, and we followed every lead down every avenue. 
I can tell you that there were literally hundreds of leads. One of the avenues was to focus on Al-Qaeda's couriers, those guys who carry messages from one senior Al-Qaeda leader to another. And it was that avenue that happened to hit pay dirt. One courier in particular caught our attention. A few de detainees identified him as one of the few couriers trusted by bin Laden. They identified him as a protege of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, again the mastermind of 9-11. And a couple detainees even speculated that he could be the kind of guy who could be living with bin Laden. So it got our interest. We first learned about him in 2002. But at that point, we only knew his Arab nickname, his so-called nom de guerre, Abu Ahmed. We did not know his true name. It took us five years. It took us five years to identify his true name. Then it took us two more years to identify his general location somewhere in Pakistan. And another year to actually put eyes on him and follow him to where he was living in Abbottabad, Pakistan. How we did each one of those three things could itself be a spy novel. And while I can't tell you how we did that, and Zero Dark Thirty did not get it quite right, um, I can tell you a couple things. It was hard, painstaking work, many more failures than successes. It was hard because the detainees who knew Abu Ahmed best were trying to protect him by limiting what they told us, by trying to deceive us, or by simply denying that they knew him. And it was hard because Abu Ahmed and his brother, who was actually living with him, were practicing extraordinary, extraordinary operational security. For example, they were living in Abbottabad in alias. So not their Arab nicknames, not their true names, but completely different alias. And they and their wives lied to their direct families about where they lived. The brothers would not turn their phone on until they were 90 minutes outside of Abbottabad. It's the kind of operational security that they practiced. When we finally found the residents, in August of 2010, this compound in Abbottabad, we were shocked. It was an extraordinarily unique compound. And I remember the evening in August when our counterterrorism officers came to Director Panetta and me and walked us through what, exactly what I'm about to tell you. The compound sat on a very large plot of land, roughly eight times larger than the other houses in the neighborhood. And its physical security measures were extensive. It had 12 to 18 foot walls topped with barbed wire. Walls sectioned off different parts of the compound. Access to the compound was restricted by two security gates. The main structure, a three-story building, a three-story house, had few windows facing the outside of the compound. And there was a terrace, terrace off the third floor bedroom that had a seven foot privacy wall. And I remember Director Panetta asking, who puts a privacy wall on a terrace? You know, a terrace is to look out at the beautiful mountains, not to prevent somebody from seeing you, right? In addition to the extensive physical security features, the behavior of the residents also spoke of extraordinary security. While the property was valued at $1 million, the compound had no phone and no internet service, unlike the neighbors. And the residents in this compound burned their trash rather than putting it out for collection like the rest of the neighborhood. And the children in the compound did not go to school, unlike the other children in the neighborhood. When we found Abu Ahmed. We thought we would have to follow him to where he lived. 
and we figured that we would have to follow him from there to where bin, bin Laden might live. But the Abbottabad compound suggested immediately, suggested immediately that bin Laden might be there with him. We took all of this to the White House, along with the formal conclusion of my analysts that there was a strong probability that Abu Ahmed was harboring bin Laden at the compound. It's the exact words they used. We made it clear that there was no direct evidence for bin Laden being there, just a strong circumstantial case. Then in the fall of 2010 came two additional pieces of information and both strengthened that circumstantial case. The first is that we learned that there was a third family living at the compound. Remember, we knew Abu Ahmed lived there, and we knew that Abrar, his brother, lived there. But we learned that there was a third family living there, one whose size and whose makeup matched the bin Laden family members that we believed most likely would be with him at this point in his life. And, interestingly, we learned that this third family never left the compound. And we learned that this third family was completely unknown to all of the neighbors. They did not know there was a third family inside. And the second thing we learned in the fall of 2010 was that Abu Ahmed was still working for Al-Qaeda. This was a really critical piece of the puzzle confirming that a man who we knew once worked for Al-Qaeda was still working for them. This ended one possibility that we feared, was that, which was that Abu Ahmed was no longer working for Al-Qaeda and was working for some drug deal, right? Um, again, I can't tell you how we learned those two things, but if I could, you would think really, really cool spy stories. <laughs> the rest of the story you know. A president made a decision to take action, and in the very early hours of Monday, May 2nd in Pakistan, still Sunday, May 1st in Washington, the United States killed the world's most wanted man. Although I'd say I had a very large lump in my throat when one of the main helicopters went down in the compound. Let me share with you a few specific moments from the bin Laden operation. First, on April 29th, 2011, I was in Director Panetta's office when he received a phone call from Tom Donilon, then our nation's national security advisor. Tom was calling Leon to tell him that the operation was a go. Sensing the significance of the moment, Director Panetta hand wrote a note immediately following the phone call. Let me read you that note, as I am absolutely convinced that it's going to be in a museum someday. Actually, it's already in CIA's museum, but it's going to be in a real museum someday. <laughs> so the note reads as follows. April 29, 2011, 10.35 a.m. Memo for the record. Received phone call from Tom Donilon, who stated that the president made a decision with regard to AC1, that's what we call the compound, Abbottabad Compound 1. The decision is to proceed with the assault. The timing, operational decision making, and control are in Admiral McRaven's hands. The direction is to go in and get bin Laden, and if he is not there, to get out. These instructions were conveyed to Admiral McRaven at 10.45 a.m. Signed, Leon Panetta. Director, Central Intelligence Agency. Second, on the night of the raid, after all the work was over, Director Panetta and I walked out of the West Wing and got to get into our SUVs to go home. It was well after midnight, but Lafayette Park was filled with people, mostly students from Georgetown and GW, who were actually drinking. <laughs> you remember you remember that they were chanting USA, USA, USA. Um, I even heard a few chants, I think, of CIA, CIA, CIA. 
I've never been prouder of my officers than I was at that moment, and I was also convinced that I was never going to hear that again. And the third, the third story I want to share with you, because people always say nobody writes like this anymore. Nobody writes like this anymore. I want to share with you a handwritten letter that I received the day after the raid from a counterpart of mine in a foreign intelligence service with whom I worked very closely and with whom CIA worked very closely against Al-Qaeda. Here's the letter. Dear Michael, may I be one of the many who offer you and the agency my most profound congratulations and deep professional admiration for this outstanding success. Brilliantly developed, conceived, planned, and executed. Exemplary stuff. The CIA at its best. Our world is one where contemporary history is carved in stark events and dates. Today is one on the side of justice and will be remembered for generations. Many successes have come before, and many are yet to come before the end of the Al-Qaeda menace. But today, the United States has written a new chapter and shown that none may escape. Outstanding. My congratulations to all. Let me, let me close here by talking about the heart and soul of CIA, the people who actually take on the mission of keeping us safe from these national security threats, the people who actually keep us safe from Al-Qaeda. The agency is blessed to have some of the most talented and dedicated officers anywhere in or outside of government. These officers work harder than anyone I have ever seen. I've had officers turn down well-deserved well promotions or spend months or more away from their families because they believe so deeply in staying focused on a key operation or initiative. The lead manager of the analysts on Al-Qaeda turned down at least a dozen promotions over a six-year period because he wanted to stay focused on Al-Qaeda. Some of these officers some of these officers have paid the ultimate price for their sense of duty. The most important place at CIA headquarters is our memorial wall. 107 stars carved into the marble to commemorate those officers who have given their life in service to their country. Now, 107 does not sound like a lot compared to our military colleagues, but it is a very large number for a civilian organization. Of those 107 stars, 27 have been added since 9-11, the vast majority of those in some way related to the fight against Al-Qaeda. Each one of those stars represents the ultimate sacrifice of a patriot and serves as a reminder that the men and women who commit to our profession, do so knowing that it is a very dangerous one. Some of you may remember the tragedy in coast Afghanistan in December of 2009. A dozen or so agency officers, many of them moms and dads, were so committed to protecting American lives that they chose to leave the comforts of home and to deploy to Coast, which is a small town in eastern Afghanistan close to the Pakistan border. They are under very harsh and very dangerous conditions. They gathered intelligence crucial to our search for al-Qaeda leaders on the other side of the border. On December 30th, 2009, a suicide bomber detonated an explosive vest that took the lives of seven of those brave officers. I can tell you from personal experience that it is gut-wrenching when the call comes that one of your own has fallen. I can tell you how hard it is to, start to stand on the tarmac at Dover when the bodies return home, to meet with grieving family members and colleagues, and to attend memorial services and funerals. Director Panetta and I had the honor of representing the agency 
at the funerals of all of these officers. Each of them was special, but I want to actually tell you guys about two of them. The first, for Harold, was in a small town outside of Boston. The funeral mass for Harold was beautiful, but what occurred after the mass was extraordinary. As we left the church for the cemetery, I saw, I saw the first sign of what was to come. A family of five, a mother, a father, and three children standing on their front porch at attention with their hands over their hearts. A few blocks more brought additional people standing in honor in driveways, at intersections, all along the road. Families, scout troops, civic groups, lone individuals. The crowds grew as we got closer to the cemetery. In the 30-minute ride, there were hundreds, perhaps a thousand Americans standing to honor our officer. They stood in 15-degree weather, holding American flags of differing sizes, many with hands over their hearts, some with signs that simply read, thank you for keeping us safe. That same day, that same day, a few hours later, I attended a memorial service in my hometown of Akron, Ohio, for another of our fallen colleagues. Small world, huh? This officer, Scott, left behind a wife and an unborn daughter whom Scott and his wife had already decided to name Piper. One of the eulogies was given by a close friend who had served with Scott in the military. At the end of this eulogy, this still-serving military officer said that he had a vision of the future. He said that he, had, that he had a vision of a young woman, her husband, and her children standing in front of the memorial wall in our lobby at CIA. He said that this young woman had her hand on one of the black stars on a memorial wall as she told her family about Scott, about his life, and about his service to his country, his contribution to freedom. He said in this vision that this young woman, named Piper by her parents, was as proud as she could be of the father that she had never met. Why do I share these stories with you? Because they go to the heart of what motivated me and what motivates many of the women and women who work at CIA. The focus is completely on the mission of keeping the country safe. And no sacrifice is too big in the pursuit of that mission, none. I am deeply, deeply honored to have worked at CIA. I am deeply honored to call the men and women who work there colleagues and friends. And I am deeply honored to have been able to share a little bit of this with you tonight. Thank you very much, and may God bless America. I must say that uh, Dean Hoffpower may agree with me on this one, that we've had a lot of programs at the Clinton School. This may have been the very best. This was a... <laughs> We do have time for questions. If you will raise your hand and please wait for the microphone to come your way. Yes, ma'am, right here and she'll get it to you. I was working at American Airlines at the time in San Francisco for the chief pilot. And so I was very aware of a lot of things that the public was not aware of in terms of security. It concerns me now when I go to the airport. And we have such a, a questionable level uh, in all areas. One of the things that bothers me is the screening process and how things have begun to slack off. Would you mind answering to that? Thank you so much for asking that question. So the threat from Al-Qaeda 
is real. It continues to exist. It's not quite at the level it was on the 10th of September, but it is, it is there and it is significant. Listen very closely. If Al Qaeda in Yemen brought down an airliner tomorrow in the United States of America, I would not be surprised. I would not be surprised. The last three attempted attacks in the United States were by Al Qaeda in Yemen. Christmas Day bomber, printer cartridge plot to bring down a couple of cargo planes, and the non-metallic suicide vest um, designed to bring down an airliner. Uh, two of those came very close to being successful, and one was only thwarted at the very end. Um, the threat is real, and now we get to the problem, which you so beautifully identified. So that sign outside of our counterterrorism center, today is September 12th, 2001. I said that's the way my officers think about their job and think about the threat. It's funny, when I get in my car, or when I, I talk like I'm still working there, when, when I got in my car and drove away from the agency, either down 123 or down the parkway, it started to feel a lot like September 10th, 2001. People have lost focus. The reaction to the NSA metadata program, which we can talk about if you want, but the reaction, to the, the reaction by the American public to the NSA metadata program would have been completely different had it happened in 2002 or 2003, as opposed to 2013. People have forgotten about the threat. I see people in line at airports complaining about having to take their shoes off. Nobody complained two weeks after 9-11. Um, you know, people, people are losing their focus, and it's not only the American public. Right? I mean, it is, it is um, some politicians. Um, and so it's a, it's a serious problem. Anna, we have a question right here. Hi, I'm a first year student here at the Clinton School and thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories with us. Um, I have a question that sort of picks up on, I guess what you just left off on, which is given the threat of um, AQAP in Yemen or other terrorist organizations like the Pakistani, Pakistani Taliban, state actors in Pakistan. What's the viability still of Al Qaeda Central? Um, if you could just speak more sure. to that and talk a little bit sure. more about that. Absolutely, great question. Um, so, the way I think about the war with Al Qaeda is we are still at war. Um, we have had a great victory in this war and they have had a great victory in this war. So our great victory in this war has been the degradation, decimation, near defeat of the Al-Qaeda leadership, what we call Al-Qaeda core in Pakistan. The people that brought you that terror on that sunny day in September. That's our great victory. Most of those people are gone. The analysts at the agency can actually envision the defeat of that group. Now, some, some things have to happen before it's gone, but they can actually envision the defeat. Their great victory, their great victory has been the spread of their ideology. So at one time it was only in South Asia. Now, it is in northern Nigeria, north into the Sahel, into primarily northern Mali, across all of North Africa, from Morocco to Algeria to Tunisia to Libya to Egypt. Al Qaeda had been gone from Egypt for two decades and it's back. Down East Africa into Somalia and now into Kenya, across the Gulf of Aden into Yemen, up into Iraq and in Syria. So that's been their great victory. So the threat to the homeland 
is less than what it was on 9-11. And by less, I mean that no Al Qaeda, no existing Al Qaeda group today can carry off what Al Qaeda carried off on 9 11, which is a, a multiple, simultaneous, catastrophic attack that kills thousands. But two parts of Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda in Yemen first, and then Al Qaeda still in Pakistan second can carry off a single attack here in the United States. A single, simple attack that could kill hundreds, could bring down an airliner, for example. The threat to US interests overseas in the past 12 years has skyrocketed. So the threat to US interests across that whole space I talked about has skyrocketed. Um, and that's what brings you things like, I, don't, I hate using this word, but it brings you things like Benghazi. Um, it brings you the mall attack in Nairobi. It brings you the attack against the, uh, the natural gas facility in Algeria. So you're going to see more and more and more attacks. Americans, by the way, were killed in two of those three attacks that I just talked about. So that's kind of where we are. I am deeply concerned that we may be headed back towards a 9-11 style threat to the homeland. And very quickly, there's two places that I worry about. One is Syria. Um, because one of the possible outcomes to the civil war in Syria is a failed state there, a collapse of the central government, uh, a collapse of the institutions of government. Um, the, particularly the military, the intelligence service, and the security service. Um, if that occurred, you would have a Syria run by regional power brokers, um, and you would have space for Al-Qaeda to have safe haven. And Al-Qaeda is doing, Al-Qaeda in Syria is doing more thinking about the day after Assad than is any other group involved in Syria and they're planning on it being another safe haven from which to attack Western Europe and the United States. So I worry about Syria. Second place I worry about, ironically, is Afghanistan, post-2014. The best case, best case, I can think of a lot worse cases, but the best case for Afghanistan post-2014 is an Afghan national security force that's capable of holding Kabul the major cities in the north and the west and the ring road. Uh, and the Taliban has, has patches of territory that it controls in the south and in the east. And when the Taliban has those sanctuaries, Al Qaeda, if it still exists, if it's not defeated yet, will move from Pakistan back into Afghanistan. So the flow will be reversed from what it was right after 9-11. They will move back to Afghanistan, and if the United States is not willing and able to deal with Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, in those Taliban sanctuaries, the threat to the homeland will reemerge, um, and will reemerge to the degree that we saw prior to 9-11. I guarantee it. So. Yes, we have a question right here. Blue Sharp, right here. Wait for the microphone here. She's going to pass the microphone over to you. Do you think Flight 370 was taken over by terrorists? I think it actually did crash. So, I'm surprised myself that it's taken this long and with CIA and other places around the world with all the intelligent people out there that we don't really know anything at this point. Yeah. So I'd say a couple things. One is um, there is no evidence of terrorism. Doesn't mean there wasn't terrorism. There's no evidence of it. Uh, the other thing I tell you is that don't rule anything out. Came from how this came up. I mean, this obviously has uh, been a, a a fear for some time. But did something happen that make him uh, concentrate on this particular uh, issue? So the honest answer is I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if anything happened to make him say that. But I'll tell you the following. So prior to 9/11. 
In fact, going as far back as bin Laden's time in Sudan before he even moved to Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was very interested in weapons of mass destruction. And we actually know for a fact that while in Afghanistan prior to 9-11, that Al-Qaeda was researching, experimenting with both chemical weapons and biological weapons. Um, and we know that they had an interest in um, both radiological dispersion devices, which is just taking a radioactive material and packing it around an explosive and spreading radiation. It's not a nuclear explosion. Um, but also in terms of getting their hands on a nuclear weapon. Um, and that was very real. And in the months after 9-11, there, there was an awful lot of threat reporting to include threat reporting of Al-Qaeda getting its hands on nuclear weapons. Where would they get their hands on a nuclear weapon? Um, think um, a like-minded extremist who happens to work for the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, right? That's how they'd get one. So there um, has been for a long time deep concern about um, Al-Qaeda and, and nuclear weapons. Um, bin Laden actually talked publicly about nuclear weapons and said that um, it would be Al-Qaeda's duty to use such weapons if they ever got their hands on them. Um, and so there's, there's been a lot of worry about that for a long time. And um, it's something that I would worry about again if they ever really got safe haven somewhere. So if they got safe haven in Syria, significant safe haven in Syria, significant safe haven in Afghanistan post U.S. withdrawal. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, that, that would be at the top of my worry list again, too. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Michael Morrell for a great program. <laughs>